Morbidly Beautiful presents a horror interview podcast hosted by Brody Hubbard. You have entered the chamber. As always, gratitude to Lil Budang for the theme song, Itching for the Blood. Welcome back to the Morbidly Beautiful Network and the Chamber, where we talk to horror creators and performers about what makes them tick and what makes them jump. And today I'm talking to Ben Woodywiss. He has this great movie review website at benwoodywiss.weebly.com that we're going to talk about. He also has video essays up on YouTube. And he's on X, Twitter, at Ben Woodywiss. We're going to talk about all the great work that he's doing, including working with kids on teaching them film. But how I first knew about him was through his feature, Benny Loves Killing. Let's look back at my original review. I thought I was sitting down to watch a horror film. The description is a girl is making a horror film and has to deal with horrors in her real life. But what this really turned out to be is what the writer and director Ben Woodowis describes as a psychodrama. Benny, a film student in London, is talking to the academic board that oversees her funding for school and her film project. She's describing the final project she wants to do in lieu of an essay. She wants to make a horror film about horror films and cinema. Her project is going to be a meta horror film that is a commentary on horror film. But that's not what Benny Loves Killing, the movie we're watching, is. Although we do get to see Benny shoot some scenes, deal with her actresses, even mix together fake blood. But you could have also told this story and have her made a sci-fi film or a Western. The reason it needed to be horror is because of Benny's philosophy on horror and the horror that we see in her life. And it's not the kind of horror that we've talked about today as far as a slasher. It's about her and her mother really being the same person. Her mother having her destructive habits and Benny having her own self-destructive habits. It's about Benny refusing hygiene or a permanent residence or even three meals a day just to subside on drugs and this passion project of hers. It's about the unstable people that Benny associates with and her further and further instability. Jeopardizing her academic program, this final film project, and her own safety. This may be a hard movie for some who have their own trauma around drugs or have family members who are addicts. And there's a very tense potential assault situation at some point that might rattle you if you've been through it yourself. While I can't guarantee you that every character gets out of this movie alive, I can let you know that this is not your standard horror with the body count kind of movie. In much the same way that Bloody Summer Camp is an ode to 80s horror, and Colobos is an ode to Italian horror, Benny Loves Killing is actually a very moving love letter to cinema and storytelling itself. It's a statement on women in film, and particularly women in horror. And it skillfully makes you invested in a person who isn't the most likable, yet you're rooting for them to succeed somehow through all their adversity, even if it is self-imposed adversity. The ending, the last scene, the last shot itself, is something I think we could have a whole discussion about. And I'm not going to give it away, but I welcome you to communicate with me if you want to talk about it, because I'm still kind of figuring out what it means. Is it the hopeful note that I want it to be? Or is it cynical, even mocking the idea of ending on a happy note? Is it redemption, or is it the betrayal of something artificial, something self-deluding, something saying that we don't actually change and get better, that we are who we are? It's an incredible film. And now... We enter the chamber with Ben Woodyless. So, you know, there's like the Scorsese thing came up. Have you, has that hit your radar yet? <laughs> Loving it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And um, I, uh, yeah, yeah, I haven't read the article. I just have read the backlash. My partner read the article and then she told me that she has to go have her blood pressure tested. Yeah. And she was like, I'm going to save you from reading this thing, but here's <laughs> here's the hot take. And um, yeah, fun, fun times. Um, yeah. Everyone has their hot take on things. It's yeah. frustrating. 
Um, I, I actually went to see Mean Streets just the other day. Um, haven't seen it for like 25 years. Yeah. And doing the 4K 50 year anniversary thing. So I'm, I'm going to have carbonated water. It's going to make a noise. Okay. Apology. Um, and it was just divine watching something like that on the big screen looking great um you're not going to get a film like that anymore it's so it's got so much vitality so much life yeah. um yeah just love it so anyway besides the point <laughs> you know th and that occurs to me um when you talk about the big screen mm -hmm. um, i would say the majority of my movie experiences have been on the the home television screen and i'm talking about not even now in the streaming era i'm talking about like when i was uh, a a teenager or a young college aged adult in the late 90s and i worked at a video store and so like my first scorsese experience like mean streets i watched on on video yeah me too yeah I, I, everything i found everything i i also used to work in a video store as well in a series of video stores yeah um, and yeah it was all small screen, not all small screen experience, but largely that. Um, sure. The big screen experiences I did have, I don't know, interesting to think about now. I was actually, I was also in a, like a, like a Sunday school where they would show 16 millimeter copies of films yeah. on the big screen. Um, and that, that was just amazing. Like uh, I, I, I went for ages, really loved it. We, we saw the dark crystal. We saw a... Oh, an Italian uh, kind of cop movie spoof. But at the time, I had no idea it was Italian. I didn't know it was shot in Italy. Yeah. Um, called like Super Snooper. I think it's okay. Terrence, maybe. Um, it's a, a policeman who's got superpowers, um, but they can be cut off by the color red. <laughs> and I was just like, what is this? Amazing, amazing stuff. Um, but yeah, largely it was small screen stuff for me as well. And they showed this at like church? Yeah, they, yeah, I think they were trying to they were trying to curry favor with the young people or something. Yeah. I it literally just turned up for these films and then left. Um, I was, but you know, it's it was a fifty p, which is I, I don't know how much, like a maybe a dollar perhaps back in the olden days. Yeah, uh, go and see the films and yeah, whatever big screen stuff I could get really. That's great. I just, I mean, it's been years since I've gone to a church or for anything that wasn't like you know my niece or nephew getting married but like um i remember them being very opposed to anything secular i i, I wouldn't imagine they would have shown any film I, I think this might be a uk us kind of split because yeah. over here um churches are really like whatever just come inside please <laughs> like you want, you know, do you want to read harry potter do you want to read about wizards and sorcery and stuff whatever just pull up some <laughs> come in have some tea um they really like a funny funny fact i ended up being the the kind of sunday school helper when my children were older and started going there and then my, my partner at the time she was the sunday school teacher which was crazy was like sun sunrise sunset <laughs> odd experience yeah um so i i want to ask you before um because i know we do we do want to talk about movies as a, a whole and, yeah. and in general and horror because it's yeah. what morbidly beautiful network focuses on the chamber focuses on and i would be remiss not to talk about how i found you which was through benny loves killing um Thanks. which is still just one of my favorite movies and, and one of my favorite commentaries on filmmaking and and the horror genre but i mean it it you know when i pulled it up i thought okay this is going to be some sort of meta commentary on horror and while that's there there's so much more yeah, there is. What, what gave you that feeling, by the way? Um, I think I, the title, and I think I read a very brief description. Okay. And I think I just decided to go for it. I'm like, this looks interesting. And I, I went for it. And I was just very wowed and moved, you know? Thank you so much. <laughs> um, yeah, it, it was an attempt to, the, the way, so it was, it was created, um, I formed a, a company called Look Think Films to start making short films. And we made these three short films, um, You Look and You Think, Kiss, Fight, Smoke, and My Name is Ida, which ended up becoming uh, a short film called Kofina Friesen, which is uh, the freeze of woman. And while making these short films, um, okay, rewind a little. Before that, 
I was screenwriting for people. So I was writing short films, features, whatever for people. I even tried some acting, um, not because I thought I could do it, but because I wanted to know how it felt to be on the other side of the camera. Because yeah. I'd, I'd been making stuff like on my own with friends since the 1980s. And one of the the kind of barriers was working with actors. Like, what, how how do you work with an actor? How do you make them feel comfortable? That kind of thing. So I tried a little bit of acting and writing. And I attended the shoots that I wrote. And I attended the shoots that I was in, of course. And I got to kind of sit there and watch how everything was being organized. And I was thinking, like, feel like there's a better way to do this. Like, uh, I feel like there's a way you could do it which would be quicker and not take so much time, be more comfortable for everyone, and also just be a kind of a, a flatter hierarchical environment for everyone so that everybody can get a say in what's going on a little bit and contribute to the process. So we did, you look and you think, Kiss Fight Smoke, my name is Ida, Kavina Friesen, and then the shooting ratio, so how much we shot in a day versus how much ended up on the screen, um, the shooting ratio was meaty. We were like, we could do one day or two days and we could get a lot of stuff on the screen. So I said to my uh, then producer, Nick Jones, let's make a feature film. We can do this. I I've got it all mapped out in my head. And we started making, um, we, we, we wrote a script for a film called Do Something Beautiful. We set up uh, a relationship with an actress in Norway who was going to help us produce it. And then everything was going great. Um, one of the big parts was I had to go to work and say, uh, can I just go over here for three months and then come back afterwards? Is that is that cool with everyone? And they were like, yeah, that's fine. So I stepped aside from work and then the and then our lady in Norway put it to us that we weren't going to be able to shoot the film. Um, what she was recommending was let's shoot half of it. And then let's wait six months to a year and then shoot the other half. And I just like, there's no way I can do this. It's not good. It's not good. <laughs> so uh, at like one in the morning or something, I had this epiphany. I've got this old script called Benny Loves Killing, which is about a 15 year old kid who lives with his mum, And it, it, horror was kind of a big part of his life. I had this dream that I wanted the mum to be played by Linnea Quigley. And I want it in, in the original script for Benny Loves Killing, the kind of voiceover narration of the film is Benny writing letters to Linnea Quigley, who like she's Linnea Quigley movie star, you know, that he's writing to. But also I wanted her to play the mum. I thought that yeah. would be a fun kind of thing. Um, so I had this script and I thought what we could do is we could do this, but it, like it needs to change radically. Benny needs to get a lot older. Um, the whole concept has to change a little bit, but but we could do this. So I <laughs> messaged my producer at like one in the morning. So honest, honestly, I think I I killed his um his his blood pressure, his heart rate throughout this whole process. And I was like, I can take the script, I can rewrite it, we can make it something that we can shoot here. And he loved the idea. So I got in touch with Norway and told them, okay, I, I think I'm out for the time being on this project, um, but you can step up and make it. And they, they, they went ahead and shot it. Um, and then back here in the UK, I turned the script into something that was achievable. And then I went on like a, a tour of London, like going to, like I, in making Benny Loves Killing, I called in every single favor that ever anyone ever owed me at all so went everywhere um looked at people's homes and thought about like what could this be where could this be and then once we had all the locations locked i then went back to the script and changed it all to make it fit in a little bit better right then we did the the casting process and we got the cast in once the cast were locked i did the same thing because some of these people just had a, a vibe that was a little different from how they were on the page. So we got to change them. And then kind of like in broad strokes, what I was hoping for with Benny was that A, it's it's a story. Um, it just works. It's a story about these people doing these things. B, there's a kind of subtext layer to it as well that people could read into if they wanted to. And C, there's a, there's a metatextual level on top of everything as well. 
you don't need to watch it and think this is a meta text film about horror films or about how women are looked at or used in horror films. You can just watch it as a movie if you like. It's fine. Right. But and we should note for the, the listener viewer who hasn't seen this yet that Benny did get changed to a, a young woman. Yes. Yeah. So as, as soon as I decided to change the character into a young woman, the whole film became much better. Um, everything became really really interesting and really kind of exciting um and what it was before was perhaps what people might expect and what it ended up becoming was something that perhaps people wouldn't expect i didn't expect it at all yeah. um it completely transformed and that like i really love stuff getting away from me i hate it when like if i'm gonna make like um like a, a cup out of clay I don't want any of my fingerprints in it. I want you to just look at it and see it as a cup that no one ever touched. Yeah. And when I started making films, when um, the first ones came in, I was like, oh, this is awful. My fingerprints are everywhere. Like you can see my hands all over this thing. It's terrible. And I really wanted to get to a place where the films just ran away from me a little bit. And they they ended up not having my voice in them, not having my, my preferences or anything. Um, and that involved kind of giving a lot of creative power to the cast and the crew and asking them for suggestions and then just letting them just kind of do things. Yeah. Uh, really satisfying experience. It's, re it's really lovely that people like you are still finding the film. Um, and it's really lovely that from first sight, you're, you're thinking, OK, there's going to be something going on here. Yeah, that's, and that's really for, for me. That's really interesting to hear and really just like the best thing what? to hear is. How much is um, how much of Pauline Kowski is in in Benny? Mm. The, the that's a that's a really good question, and the answer is um, a I don't know, b a lot. So um, so put, the way that I directed Pauline was we we had lots of conversations before filming, where I would talk for ages, and then she would talk for ages. And I think Pauline, Pauline lived in like the last building in the UK where you were allowed to smoke inside. So <laughs> the pair of us were just sitting there, like just filling the room <laughs> with a, with a phone <laughs> and chatting back and forth. And then when we got onto the set and when we we're actually filming, there's very, very little talking between us. Um, it, it boiled right down to slower with more love. And she would be like this. And she, I kind of let her do free reign on things um, with just a few words in there. My producer, Nick, and I, we had a conversation about what Pauline was doing. And Nick has a theory about this that he's never shared with me. Um, <laughs> he, he didn't want to share it on the shoot. I don't know what his theory is. I have my own theory about what I think Pauline is doing. Um, so I think B, there's a lot of her in this. Um, also like Pauline is a really, really kind of like, she, she's lovely. She's great. She's also quite closed and quite, quite a private person. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't kind of poke around and ask, what are you doing here? Why are you doing this? What's going on here? So, but I mean, I'll say a lot of Pauline. It's, it's, it's the Pauline Coosty show. Like she's in every single shot in the film. And if there was a second where you thought, I don't buy this, just like just for a second, then everything kind of collapses. But that never happens because she's just like, she's on all the way through it. Yes. Um, and yeah. that's very, without spoiling it for the viewer here um, or listener, the very final shot. Mm -hmm. <sighs> yeah. Man, what can I say about it? Because it's, it's either I've and I've read reviews of it that say it's either and without spoiling to sum up for those who haven't seen it. There's two things you need to know about this movie. Not everybody gets out alive. And that's all I'll say about that. So there is death, even if there isn't necessarily killing. Well, we'll we'll we'll, we'll leave that to your imagination for now. Watch the movie. But also, um, Benny is very. I mean, she's kind of a, 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 she is a screw up. Like there's a lot of um, horrible things going on with her and her life and the way she treats her own body. 
and the way she treats others. <laughs> and yet, yet she's immensely likable. Uh, you do end up rooting for her, I I feel. And, and part of that is, you know, just rooting for somebody in a story. It's this great storytelling. And of course, Pauline Cousy's great performance. But there's this final shot that you can read one of two ways. Either it's um, very cynical, tongue-in-cheek parody of movie happy endings, or there has been a sincere transformation and we can walk away happy for where we leave this world and where we leave Benny. And I've read reviews that say, I don't know which this is. And so um, do you feel like you can say, or would you rather us just figure it out ourselves? <laughs> I, I would much rather people figure it out themselves. I'm I'm really happy with people identifying that it could be one of two things. Why not? Why not both? Um, <laughs> but yeah, it's it's. I feel like everything in the film could be one of two things all the way along, and that that final shot was like really important that we got it right, um, because it, it, if we got it wrong, it would end up feeling more one thing than the other thing, perhaps. And having that kind of that high wire balancing act of we we can be two things at the same time it was, was something I really loved. Like honestly, watching that shot when because like when we filmed everything, I never looked at the monitor. I had this um, back in nineteen ninety nine. I worked for Troma. I was like a production assistant, assistant sound. And one of the things I picked up from Uncle Lloyd was you never look at the uh the the monitor you always look at the actor because they they need something like that so I was always just looking at the actor and so when we filmed that scene I didn't know what it looked like <laughs> um <laughs> and it wasn't until we got into the edit with Anita that I actually saw it in the screen and but we just got we got so excited um it was glorious it's a, it's a really lovely final shot um really lovely like it's it's more than I could have hoped for at all and I'm, re I'm really glad that, um, yeah, yeah, people, people identify that it could be one of two things. Yeah, yeah. What comes to mind really quickly is um, the, the finale of Mad Men, in that there's a oh. lot of folks who, um, not, not so much in the shot itself, um, mm -hmm. I'll, 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 more that, you know, um, and we'll again, uh, avoid spoilers for the, the two people out there who haven't watched Mad Men, but like, <laughs> okay <laughs> here's one of them i i saw the first like three seasons yeah and, and then i kind of dropped out i was like i i i don't think anything's ever going to happen in this show and so uh, I, my my partner um was like you should have come back everything everything goes wild after that it but does yes, I, I don't know what the final shot is well you can binge it and and it'll be worth your time binging over a weekend or two um i will say that you know Don, you leave Don either having been completely transformed or you think that this final act uh, of Don's that we get to see anyway is um is cynical. Um, okay. so it's it's, it, it's it's kind of up to you um to to decide whether and is almost kind of besides the point where um where it it's 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 just a funny place. It it, it 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 ends on a comic note. I will say that. Does it end on the beach? Um, it ends with I think his last scene might be on a beach. Okay, but it's not the final shot of the show. Isn't him? Ooh, <laughs> interesting. Okay. Yeah, we'll leave we'll leave that there. <laughs> um, and I I did know about the 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 trauma work. I actually just met Lloyd Kaufman a couple weeks ago. Oh, um, how How's he doing? He's great. He's so wonderful. Like you can, I always had this view of him as kind of a smart ass that just in interviews and videos and things like that, not a mean man in it by any means, but he was a kind man and like hit it off with my, my eight year old son at the time. He just turned nine as we were talking about earlier. Um, they hit it off so well. It was really cute. Oh, yeah. He's, he's a really lovely guy. He, uh, when I was, um, I don't think I actually spoke to him for quite a while because I was dealing with the kind of line producer and the, the executive producer and stuff for, for a, a bit. But then I met him in Poughkeepsie when principal photography was about to start and he came over to introduce himself to me, to me, little tiny British PA, sat in this office. 
and he was saying like it's it's so great that we've got um a british person here it's, it's great that we've got someone who knows what a subjunctive is and then walked away and i was sitting there like i have no idea what a subjunctive is but um, <laughs> feel free to have faith in me in that way <laughs> he was really lovely just a really nice guy happy to kind of turn around and just ask anyone for ideas and stuff <laughs> um and this was citizen toxic correct toxic avenger oh. Toxic Avenger 4, which is not my favorite trauma film ever made. <laughs> um, I kind of wish I'd worked on Terra Firma. I think that would have been like amazing. Yeah, yeah. That was the follow. Uh, I'm sorry, not the follow up. I should say I know it as um, I had watched feel- that. Sorry, go ahead. No, 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 no. Uh, I-, I was just saying I had watched that after Tromeo and Juliet because uh, of Will Keenan knowing that yeah. he was in it. Yeah, it's, it's the follow up to Tromeo and Juliet, really. Yeah um yeah Tromi and Juliet terra firma for me that's kind of like that's that's peak trauma like yeah. that's the, the the pinnacle um and I like Citizen Toxie was an amazing experience absolutely incredible um so pleased I did it yeah uh, uh not my favorite trauma film it's got some great moments in it and if you if you watch very carefully you'll see me in it for like one second I was only in one scene I don't know if you know um Trent uh, Trent Harger, the guy who wrote and starred in Citizen Toxie. So he was also the kind of AD for the shoot as well. And every time there was like a crowd scene or a, a something, he was going, Ben, come on, be in the movie, be in the movie. And I was like, no, 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 no. He was like, why, why don't you want to be in my film? Come on. <laughs> and so I, I was finally in, I just didn't want to be on camera. Um, but then finally I was like, okay, one scene, we're all in. Me, assistant camera, assistant, you know, we're all coming in for this one moment and we all got costumes and dressed up and re- like blink and you miss us, but <laughs> recorded on 35 mil, which was great. <laughs> um, I don't know if you ever watched James from Dead Meat, uh, who does like the kill counts. No, I've, n- I've never heard of this Dead Meat before. Like I was reading, I was looking for um, some good kind of horror YouTube channels the other day and I found myself in a Reddit where people were giving advice and everyone was saying dead meat and i've never heard of or seen this thing before gotcha so. definitely worth checking out i'll send you some like you know good ones to start with yeah. um but he came to mind because he had a live stream uh yesterday and somebody asked something in a chat about trauma and and james had said um oh i know what it was they were talking about terrifier and uh somebody said and, and he was talking about this movie and he said you know, I know what it was. Somebody asked if Terrifier had been put out by trauma. And he said, no. Um, he, he's like, but sometimes I will speak of trauma as its own genre. And, yes. and, and I, I find it found myself in reviews like saying, oh, this movie has a trauma sense of humor. And um 100%. 100%. It's it's a whole it's a whole kind of subgenre of horror comedy, which like if you say trauma, everyone understands immediately what you're talking about. And right. it doesn't like it doesn't really matter whether they made it or whether they just bought it and distributed it. It's it's the same tone, the same feel. Yeah. I, I you you have to say trauma sometimes, even when it's not a trauma film. It just <laughs> it works. Yeah, it's just interesting to me how we can say like, oh, this is kind of like a Hammer films, you know, vibe, or this is a trauma vibe, or um, now a lot of people speak about like an A twenty four vibe, you know, and and maybe they just mean elevated horror. I don't know, but. Um, I'm still I'm with John Carpenter on not being a hundred percent sure what elevated horror means. Um yeah. but yeah, yeah. But I I I too understand what the A24 reference means. <laughs> um your review site is great because you don't review in a straight narrative review kind of way where you're like no. you're the actors, this is what the movie is about, this is what happens, or what I'll tell you what happens and whether you should see it or not. It's more of a stream of consciousness or or you know a prose piece written about, like I said, a vibe. <laughs> you know, can you tell me about that approach? Absolutely. Yeah. So um so I get a bit kind of film reviews are great, but <laughs> they always kind of they always discuss this like it's an objective fact, like this film is great or this film is not great or whatever. And they all kind of hit the same beats. Um, it's a story about this. It stars these people. It does this. And for me, like number one, when I'm in a film and it finishes, it's very difficult for me to have a, an idea of, of where I sit on this film because sometimes it takes years for me to understand ha- w- what kind of impact a film is having on me. Like the piano, when I first saw the piano, hated it. 
didn't I just thought it was awful what a waste of time and then I saw it like three years later and I was like I was like weeping this film is amazing <laughs> like what, what, what was wrong with me and so kind of where you're at when you watch a film can kind of like dictate where you go a little bit yeah and also like what one of the things I'm kind of trying to do is look at how kind of films become kind of intertwined into the subconsciousness of uh, a particular person who's had particular experiences and they kind of become part of your life a little bit and sometimes I find the easiest way to talk about that is by talking about something else so let's take a look at this this study that was done on pigeons and how they respond to different colors and stuff and that will directly feed into what I was thinking about when I was watching the film um but I've taken it like so abstract like so far away from talking about the film that we're we're kind of we're not even talking about the film anymore we're talking about something else but that that's what I was thinking about I started thinking about pigeons and responses to color and how different colors have different effects on our mood and stuff and if you're reading that then you should know like okay this film color is important um I see I see where you're going with that and that that's and I just I didn't want to sign off with this film is great two thumbs up go see it <laughs> and it's a you know this is this is my starting point you go watch it and have a little think about what it gets you thinking of nice so you keep up with the reviews um you're also um doing kind of essays of your own I'm, at the moment i'm doing video essays yeah i'm trying to i don't really i'm kind of scattergunning it so i'm a guest on a podcast the outside center film podcast but going on for a few years I'm doing um, these video essays because like a big part of me um, and like is is how I talk because I, I have a particular, I have a, everyone has a voice, but I have a particular voice and a particular way of talking, which if you know me and then you read something that I've written, you're like, oh, oh, wow. Oh, I can hear that voice going on. And I kind of thought like, I need to do something because the, the film, the film reviews are great um but but my voice is missing from them and I kind of wanted to make something playful and fun but also a little bit heart heart rending a little bit touching and emotional as well which is kind of like what I'm doing with that whole thing yeah absolutely yeah. um you continue to work within short films and and featuring other short films people's short films and yep. um, yeah you... so that, sorry go ahead oh no no um, no, yeah. So I'm still doing. I still do screenwriting. I still, I still keep a, a hand in short films. I've been working with a guy called Ryan Jeffrey, who's New York based. We had a short film called The Call come out uh, last year. There are other projects we've been working on, and that I've been working on as well. But I've spent like the last few years. I did because I don't really talk about this on social media in the the wider world. I spent the last few years working on youth outreach filmmaking projects. Yes, yes, that's what I was getting at. <laughs> How did how did you know? I I I'd never talk about this. <laughs> you, I I I'm good at my job. <laughs> okay. okay, amazing. Um, yeah. So so yeah. Did you have a question about? Oh, no, just or... yeah, what you wanted to say about it? Yeah, that that's where you. Yeah, you're you're. I which I think is great. It, it's um, because it, it, there's so many ways, paths to filmmaking and learning filmmaking, um, yeah. and that's one I don't think people think about but it's it makes so much sense to pass that on to you know a, a new generation yes yeah it, it, it's kind of there's the kind of filmmaking and careers and industry side of it but then there's also a kind of like a human side as well of just what if you're a I'm going to use the term young person because we use the term young person but we're kind of talking about five to 19 year olds right. but we a young person yeah um but there's there's also something that young people get when they work with a group of other people for a shared goal. They may unlock things about themselves that they didn't necessarily know beforehand, which is kind of exciting. And so since 2018, I've been doing um, the Camera Chica filmmaking project, which is a it's a youth outreach filmmaking project that takes place in uh, official development assistance territories, ODA territories. So we so it's Nepal uh Pakistan Rwanda Egypt and Sri Lanka were the the five that I've done so far and when you normally do like a youth outreach filmmaking project you get a filmmaking practitioner some someone who's got like their full camera kit and sound kit in a bag 
they go into a school and they work with the kids for a day or two days or or whatever everyone has a great time and then they leave and they leave all of and they take all of their equipment and all of their enthusiasm and knowledge and experience with them and so what camera chica is is camera chica is something where you teach the adults who work with the children whether they're teachers or whether they're youth workers or whatever they are you take them through the filmmaking steps over a, a five-day period um, you get them to play the role of a child you get them to feel how the children they work with are going to feel when they do their film um, you may feel exposed you may feel like you're you're making a fool of yourself and stuff that's that's good because that's how the kids are going to feel as well so you need to understand what they're going to be going through so we take all of the adults through that process and then there's another week where all of the kids come in and they do their filmmaking Monday to Friday with their adults that they know. And then my team are kind of in the room as kind of assistants, if you like. Yeah. And then we've also got like on the ground assistants as well. So in every country, we find like TV, radio, um, university students. We find people who work in the industry there. They come in and become the mentors. So you've got like room full of kids, the adult that they know, and then British people and local people in the background who can help if, if, if needed. And then the idea is, is that at the end of it, we, it's not the idea, <laughs> how it works is at the end of it, we leave uh, all of the equipment there. So we've got an adult who is fired up and we've got, they've got everything that they might need in the room for future filmmaking projects. And it's just like, it's just really great, man. It's just really like a very, very positive experience. Um, it was a huge hit in Nepal. And the, the the team that I was working with out in Nepal, with the, they were just amazing. Um, they still are amazing. And the Nepal Film Development Board um, kind of got wind of what we were doing. And they were like, okay, this is cool. We like this. Um, can We would like to roll out something like this but across the whole country so they spoke to to me and the nepal team and we put together a kind of uh, a beat sheet for how they could do this kind of thing and then they got funding from unicef and rolled out the children's film society so it goes across the entire country and it's kind of putting filmmaking at the center but the idea is it's not just like careers and stuff it's also a platform for young people to be heard and for them to say, like, this is what the world looks like from where I'm standing. And then also a platform for other people to see these stories as well and to understand. So and Nepal's been insane. Like the, the, the films the kids make just get millions of views. So it has filmmaking at the center, but then also film watching. Um, so film reviewing, film watching, and then also familiarizing Nepalese children with their own kind of cinematic heritage. Um, and so they get to watch like, it's kind of just important that you know what the heritage of your own country cinema is, not just, I don't want to be, I don't want to be bad, but not just American films. Cause like everywhere you go, everyone's just watching American movies and like every, everybody knows who Leonardo DiCaprio is. Um, but they don't know who their own kind of superstars are and they don't know what it's like to, well, they, they do, but they don't know what it's like to see a film and suddenly go like, oh my God, that's my town. Like, that's what it looked like in 1973 and stuff. And um, it's just like, it's it's kind of a, a, a cool thing. It's, it's, there's a lot of strength in it. Um, so that that went so well that I'm I'm now doing a project connecting Scotland, Nepal and Egypt, children in all three countries. So we're getting the kids. So what we do is we start in one country and we get kids, we, we take them to a filmmaking camp, we teach them about filmmaking, but filmmaking as an artistic practice rather than a kind of narrative thing. And so, so we're getting them to think about space, color, sound, perspective and stuff. And then, and then we get them to make film, um, but uh, the film camp ends, they go home, and then we get them to make a film like back where they are. And they're, you know, they're all from the same country, but now they're spread out all over the place. So they're filming different things. And they, in, I worked directly with Scotland and the, some of the Scottish kids live on little islands in the middle of nowhere. Some of them live in big cities so they can get different kinds of shots. They can get like beaches and they can get cities and, and stuff. And then they create their film together on a, a virtual basis. 
um, and then they've they've made a film together. And then stage two, which is where we introduce the kids to kids from Egypt and Nepal. And we put them into groups and we get them filming things and we get them editing together footage from all different, all three countries. And these are kids from like eight to 13. So it, it's a really kind of beautiful age where they're just, they're just positive about everything. They're just enthusiastic. And, um, and it's just really lovely to kind of watch these kids kind of like reach out and hold hands across a, you know which they they couldn't do any other way and they uh, uh, it's just really nice it's just a really really lovely experience um I've, I've been a bit a bit blessed to to have all these kind of opportunities I've kind of become like in the space of a few short years I've kind of become the the youth outreach filmmaking guy for working with kids in different countries which is like it's just really lovely yeah yeah, it's no, no. yeah. um it, it I I think of the um, David Chase movie, um, Not Fade Away, which mm -hmm. was really his love letter, not only to cinema, but to music. And for him, it was specifically important to talk about how those two things foster expression and connection. Yeah. And as somebody who used to do music um, and play out quite frequently, I, I definitely have always known that about music. I, I would say that it's a more recent lesson to me how wonderfully cinema does, and, and the art of, of filmmaking does connect people and, and connect, um, like you said, can connect across cultures. Yeah, and it, it's, it's one of the things I love about it is how empathetic cinema is. Like you can write a really good piece of writing, um, but it's not going to have quite the, the empathy to it um that a, a, a piece of moving image will have and so when a kid makes a film about something they care about and it doesn't have to be like a narrative film it can just be like here's a river in my town which used to be amazing and now looks like garbage yeah um, it, when they make a film like that suddenly you're not just kind of like you're not reading cold hard facts or opinions you're kind of getting into the feel of how this kid feels about things and it's, it's a really great empathetic connection tool um it, it has so many kind of crossover uses so like yes there's industry yes there's work you know yes you can go and become like a, a dp or an editor or a whatever but also like it just puts you in touch with something inside yourself as well and it it puts you in touch with how to work with other people how to kind of problem solve how to communicate how to be accountable um, it's just like it has a lot of um, yeah a lot of a lot of potential yeah love it um yeah. you and I agreed we should talk some uh, specifically around horror so we're yeah. gonna do that um by entryway it, oh, Hall Halloween's coming up as well this is the yeah yeah I um I actually my mission this month which I have achieved is that Michael Myers was my most neglected like classic slasher figure i had seen the newer trilogy just because um everybody had been talking about it very divisively so i had to make my own opinion which i'm happy to share um if if, if we want to talk about that i had seen enough of one and two that i had felt like i had seen it i've seen three a couple times it's the you know had been the black sheep of the family but a lot of the friends i know in the horror community love it um and four five and six i really only got kind of a oh and I'd even seen like the Buster Rhymes one my point being like I decided to actually watch all the movies all the way through I have achieved that finally have you, have you included the Rob Zombie ones as well so the Rob Zombie ones I am like the biggest fan of and I I am definitely in the minority on it feels I, I completely hear you I, I like if you're going to remake Halloween the the David Gordon Green remake is is great unarguably it's it's a really good film and it it also kind of has the feel of the first one as yeah. well. Great. We all love it. However, <laughs> if you're going to remake a film, why not do it 100% differently? And why not do it what in, in the way which is very established as your way of making a film? Yeah. It's handled. It's long lenses. It's got that 70s vibe. Here's my wife again in this, in this movie. And um, I love the Rob Zombie Halloween. I just think it's amazing. Absolutely. Yeah. 
Fantastic. Um, I think there should be more remakes where people just get carte blanche to do it their way. Because yeah. like we, we've seen the original one. We love the original one. It's fantastic. Um, the David Gordon Green one is great because the first one was great, perhaps, maybe, possibly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the Rob Zombie ones I love. I'm, I'm a big fan of the, the first Rob, Rob Zombie one and Halloween 3, Season of the Witch. Oh, my God. It's, it's just divine. Um, did, did, do you know the, the scoop on why Halloween 3, Season of the Witch exists? So my understanding was there was a uh, kind of a interest in doing an anthology. And so that was the attempt to finally push past Myers and, and do the anthology way. Because I heard, I, I don't know if this is true, but John Carpenter's plan was every year he was going to make a Halloween movie and every year it was going to be completely different. There was going to be no connection between any of the movies at all. And um, Halloween 2 happened without his say-so. So by the time Halloween 3 came out, audiences were like, what the hell is this? Where's the <laughs> in the mask? Where's Michael Myers? And the whole thing just didn't work at all. Yeah. Um, so they just like nix it. But Halloween 3 is glorious. Um, really, really love that one. That's kind of one of my, of the original, my God, is it six, seven, eight, nine films? The, there the kind have of... been 13 films altogether, if you count zombies. Wow. Okay, yeah. so... Of the original kind of like Halloween films, for me, like one and two are, are, are great, but three is so special. Um, it's unique and I love it. I'm a big fan of films which would never see the light of day in any <laughs> other way. Like they, something happened and they just kind of like strove to exist. Um, right. And that's kind of Halloween three for me. Four, four five, six. The less said, the better. <laughs> God bless you for watching four, five, six again yeah um, yeah yeah love three that's a really fun kind of and you're doing this like as a halloween kind of exercise or yeah i might make a video uh for video of the damned about it because uh kind of present my brief overview of each of those i've already done in depth on rob zombies halloweens um and halloween 2 like is uh, his halloween 2 is one of my favorites um and i think he got to see some of those ideas through on Lords of Salem, where he kind of got to tap into his inner Argento. Yes. Lords of Salem was a very, very satisfying experience. Yeah. Uh, really enjoyed it. I, I, I'm the guy who, I went to go see House of a Thousand Corpses and I was like, yeah, it's kind of like, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure tonally how I feel about that film. Like it's kind of all over the place. Yeah. And the Devil's Rejects comes along and every everything changes from yeah. the devil's rejects onwards it was i can um the first time i saw the devil's rejects so this this is a potentially sad story but um so i uh i was in a difficult place i got a phone call saying that my father had had a heart attack and c could i come to see him he doesn't live in the united kingdom so that means uh taking time off work getting a plane ticket flying out there for a good stretch of time my kids were really young at the time. So I had to kind of like think about how am I going to get them over there? One of them doesn't have a passport. What am I going to do? And I thought, uh, okay, there's nothing I can do right now. It was like nine o'clock at night. And there's nothing I can do to fix this situation. I'm going to go to the cinema. I'm going to see what's out there. I'm, I'm not in the mood at all, but I'm going to sit down and watch whatever I can find. And that, that was where the devil's rejects was. So I was, I was by myself, a broken shell of a man kind of stumbling into the cinema. And I sat down, I thought, this is insane. You're not going to pay any attention to the movie. You're just going to be like thinking, thinking, thinking as this all plays out. And four minutes in, everything was like washed away. And it, it was such a fantastic cinematic experience watching this ah oh, glorious film. Absolutely loved it. So yeah, from, from then on, from Rob Zombie, I've been like, get back to those those Devil's Rejects kind of feelings, get 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 back into those vibes. And Lords of Salem was a really great one because it was like Devil's Reject, but yeah, like you say, Argento <laughs> coming in. It's, um, I think it's the best use of Mozart's, uh, is it his Requiem? And it, it's a, a Mozart piece of music. Yeah. yeah. Abs absolutely fantastic. Best use ever in cinema, I think. Yeah. And he also tried to shoot like Kubrick, which I know is is was one of the things he said. He went against his instincts on purpose. 
I did not know that he was doing that, but yeah, you can feel it. He's not doing because he's he is Mr. Handheld, long lenses, 70s feel. Um, but yeah, you can feel something's different in that film. Yeah, yeah. I I did the um the Friday the thirteenth recently because I like I had never seen them. Like I saw number one and then I was like, <laughs> I'm good. <laughs> I'm gonna <laughs> I wander away. So I never actually saw any of the other movies. Oh, ex- I saw Jason X for, yeah. for reasons. I can't explain. I saw that. I thought, yeah, that's that is exactly what I expected it to be. But then, like last year, I was like, I'm going to watch all of the Friday the Thirteenth movies. Here we go, and that that was a really fun experience. Totally skipped number three because, yeah. like, everyone was just saying, uh, you need to see it in 3D or it's not worth it. So skipped it. But that was an amazing experience. Like, really, really fun. The kind of peaks and troughs of that franchise. Uh, absolutely. And whereas like Halloween, Michael Myers, and and to a big extent, Leatherface and the Chainsaw Massacre series as well, you kind of have your choose your own adventure timelines. Friday the 13th is relatively linear. And Nightmare on Elm Street is definitely linear, I believe. I, I know those series will sometimes ignore or retcon a bit of the ending of the previous movie so that they can carry on something. But um, Jason is really, you, you have your introduction to the universe and this tease at the end that you know maybe jason is really still out there and then yeah. they commit to it with two three four yeah they do the, the the season of the witch in the friday the 13th universe is definitely how uh friday the 13th five new beginning yes but, <laughs> but it's, it's glorious with it like it works really well yeah then you have yeah. six seven and eight which is its own i think kind of its own trilogy um, with more of a zombified Jason. And then you have these little. Yes. Sorry. It's, it's all coming back to me now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> then yeah. outliers. Jason goes to hell is its own thing. Jason X is its own thing. The Friday the 13th remake is its own thing. And to some extent, Freddy versus Jason is its own thing. Yeah, for sure. I, I still haven't done the Friday the 13th remake yet. Um, I've, I think I've watched like the first four minutes a hundred times, but I haven't, I haven't quite. <laughs> <laughs> I'll do I'll do more but yeah it was it was just really fun to kind of um to wander through like what like 12 years of the growth of a franchise yeah. and in you know in like two days yeah and just see all the different things people are trying a lot of people don't like that in number two they just kind of like pull the rug out of number one completely like number one has it you know spoiler alerts it's the mum and then in movie number two they're like Actually, Jason was alive the whole time. Sorry, we, we sorry we never mentioned that before. <laughs> um, and then, yeah, once they've done that, then you're kind of rolling. Then you're like, it, it's Jason all the way down the line. It, really interesting experience. I I think like Halloween, October. I think more people should kind of get out there and watch um, a franchise, watch something they've never seen before as well. Um, it's really I, I actually last year did the Friday uh, Nightmare on Elm Streets as well because um, it had been years since I'd seen them. I think I never saw um, Dream Warriors. No, yeah, number three. I never I never That's actually saw fun. Dream Warriors. Right? <laughs> so I <laughs> so went back, watched them. Um, I loved number two much more than I remember loving it as a young person. Yeah. I really, I really enjoyed how different number two was, but watching it as an adult with kind of insight into some of the subtextual elements going on in number two, I was like, this is amazing. Um, this this needs to be put in a museum. It's incredible. And then when I got to number three, I was just like, why did I never watch this as a teenager? Why did I skip this one? <laughs> just like belong because it's incredible. It's like um, it's like a, a Marvel universe movie for for Freddy. It's glorious. It's on, it was so much fun. I actually I did this um, during the the King's coronation as a kind of like I'm not going to watch the coronation. I'm going to watch something else. So I watched. <laughs> The Night Run Out Street series. Great, great. <laughs> yes. I, I feel like m- my theory is that that series might have had more consistency because of solely because of Robert England's presence on set. I would imagine that he wasn't going to let anything too out there fly because at the end of the day, he's the one who has to consent to putting the makeup on and, and, and carrying the franchise. Whereas the Halloween movies and the Friday the 13th movies have this kind of revolving um, influence of producers and different people behind the mask and things like that. 
And so, uh, and, 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 and same with, with, with Texas Chainsaw. I just, it just amazes me that looking back and trying to kind of navigate the timelines of Halloween. Yeah. That Elm Street got away with being so linear. But it's, it's got to be a bit of rubbish, eh? No, because like rubbish is there the whole time. That's and like, and like he's, he's, he's claws in to the thing. He's not one of these producers who's like, you, you guys do whatever you want and I'll come check up on you later. He's like there every day. Like right. what's going, what's happening? Can my sister get a role in this one? <laughs> this, it's got to be something like that. I, I'm a huge fan of um, Wes Craven's new nightmare. I think like after Nightmare on Elm Street 5, where do you, where do you go from whew, the dizzy heights of number five? <laughs> uh, I think the Wes Craven's new nightmare, absolutely perfect. And like Robert Shea turning up, like, like everyone turning up, but when your producer turns up and has such a kind of a, a key, not a key role, but a key role in the film, it's just, yeah, it was a really special film right up until the last 20 minutes. <laughs> yeah, loved it. What, no, no. what do you want this Halloween? Sorry, what do you want? No, no, no. I I think next Halloween I should do the Hellraiser series because I've seen one and two, and to me that's a perfect duo of movies. And um, I I have not. I'm 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 ashamed to say have not seen the other ones. I did meet um, uh, uh, oh, what's Paul's last name? Paul Taylor. He's a lovely man who who played one of the the new pinheads after Douglas Bradley left behind the role. Get away! Um, That's fantastic. I I was a big fan of Hellraiser three, Hell on Earth um as a teen that was a great one i never saw i never saw any of the others i've seen a lot of talk about how terrible some of the others are <laughs> yeah I it's never... the same, you know and i wasn't sure if hellraiser 3 was going to be i i did see the hulu remake or, or reimagining a reboot whatever yeah i have not i've not seen this at all hell, hell on earth is like like it's juvenile as all hell but um you know you've you've got clive barker's amazing first one You've got the kind of dusty, fascinating second one, hit and miss. And then wouldn't it be great if we just went to New York and put this all in a in a club <laughs> somewhere <laughs> in a club and just put the Cenobites in this kind of weird nightclub? Should we should we just do that? See, I can see why they would do it. Hellraiser 3 is fun. And it's also kind of like it has a touch of the Candyman's to it, where you've got this like central female character who's kind of like pursuing the truth. Um so it's not, it's, it's okay. It's fine. It's fun. <laughs> Have you gotten to look at any of the kind of um, new slasher icons in training, like any of either the retro stuff, like third Saturday in October, or like, you know, your Terrifier, Terrifier 2? Have not, hold on a second. I haven't seen any of these. I think the last, let me think about this for a second. Um, I, I delved into all of the new French extreme horror films because like I, I try and keep a, a breast of what's going on around the world and the new French extremism was kind of fascinating to me um, and then I saw Martyrs and then and then I bathed myself in bleach and then tried to eradicate all memories of the film from my mind um, I feel like I have oh I mean the Saw films obviously um, yeah. kind of goes without saying I took my son to go and see Saw X recently because I kind of wanted to let's see where where this is going and we, there was nobody else in the cinema apart from one drunk man who decided to become our best friend. <laughs> so, like we had this saw X experience, and then at the end of it, my son was like, "More saw, more saw, more saw." So we um, we came home, watched Saw Five, which I haven't seen for a very long time. Where they've gone? I, have you seen Saw X? I've not seen Saw X. I've seen and I've seen a couple of the Saw movies here and there. So where they've gone with Saw X is kind of like it then they've opened a door to coming back for saw 11 saw 12 saw 13 so but i will say gladly happily like they've they've come up with a good idea here like a nice way back into the franchise franchise which doesn't feel exploitative or doesn't feel like you're you're draining the well too much um i haven't seen that many other slasher movies and i'm getting to that age now where um I'll have to do this when watching a lot of horror films, like depending on what happens. I had to do this a lot watching Saw X. No spoilers, but oh my God. Um, but yeah, I haven't seen 
any of the kind of new generation of slasher films, I don't think. I'm I'm not adverse to them. I'm not like yeah. I don't believe in them at all. I just like haven't bumped into them yet. I've got like a, a Shudder subscription. So like when stuff turns up on Shudder, I check it out. Um I'm I'm very you know this whole conversation about cinema is dead. Um cinema is now just Marvel movies, cinema is just a um uh, like a, a, a amusement park, theme park ride, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Yes. But um, where that's not true, I think, is kind of mid to low budget horror films, because like, was it last year that Skinnamarink came out? Like, yeah, it was like right at the end of 2022, got on everybody's radar. And then I think it had a proper release, uh, 2023, like festival circuit. In yeah. The so, so like I, I saw it at the cinema. I saw it as a big screen experience with a cinema full of people going, what the hell was that? But the fact that like, these two kids i think like made a film for like what twenty thousand dollars or something and suddenly it's it's all over the cinemas like that's amazing and you only get that with horror or like because horror is kind of a flexible genre so you get people watching things which aren't necessarily horror but they kind of have the the feel or the tone or they have the the things in place which make you think this is a horror film so You'll get horror fans. Horror fans will go and watch Skin of Marink, um, a film which is arguably an art installation piece. Um, but then they'll also go and watch things like Andrei Zolovsky's Possession, which is just a, a really, really unpleasant film about a divorce, about a couple separating. Like it's not not it's not a horror film. Um, and I, I really love that about horror that people will kind of like wander around and watch all these kind of crazy little films. Um, and I think mid to low budget horror is is blooming. It's kind of doing better than ever. Well, I, I, I'm I'm not the big money guy, but from <laughs> from my perspective, it looks like it's doing really well. I saw um, a film the other day called Birth Rebirth. I don't mm-hmm. know if that cropped up on your radar at all. The title has, yeah, I definitely am familiar with the title. So it's just a it's Frankenstein, just reimagined um, with this these these two. Uh, health workers one of them one of them is doctor one of them is is a nurse and it's just a really small simple film about what if you could bring the dead back to life what if you could do this and and here's how it would happen but it's it's like a two-hander between these two actresses and one of them i think her name is marin ireland she plays the 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 crazy dr frankenstein lady and oh my god what a revelation like it was an absolute delight to sit in her presence for 90 minutes while she kind of, she does her crazy doctor thing. Mm. And um, yeah, I feel whenever, whenever I see these kind of films, I feel like rejuvenated and my, my kind of hope in cinema and in the strength of audiences is kind of renewed. It's just, it's a lovely experience. Yeah. I, I, the whole year of 2022 for me was very um, restorative. I, I was just so, I had, been a horror fan all my life but um you know and there were different there's all sorts of different interests and hobbies and things I I I get into and but in the last few years because of the rise of horror conventions in my area in 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 Arizona yes and like stores like horror themed stores opening um and my kids being gravitating towards it independently and me being like yeah I'm happy to take you to this stuff um and then 2022 comes along and just like this great year. And, and for me, and why I asked about Terrifier 2 was because that was one of those experiences where this film made for not a whole lot of money and it gets put, put on the big screen. And at, at the time, I'm like, wow, when's the last time I went to a theater and was excited to go to a theater to see something that wasn't wasn't like a Spider-Man movie. And yes. I and I go and see this great you know film on the big screen with my friends and yeah. It's uh, like I said, horror icon in the making um, and, and having that feeling again, it was very inspiring. And it took me through here at, towards the end of 2023, where it's just like, yep, we're, we're, we're rolling, you know? And, and then to see something like, I keep telling people about the third Saturday in October films, because now you have this thing where folks can make um, films, not only in a genre, but they can give you like, Hey, this is my version of an early '90s horror movie, and that's what he did first. Uh, Jay Burleson, he does um, Third Saturday in October Part Five. You watch that first, 
It yeah. takes place in the early 90s. And then you go back and see Third Saturday in October, and that's his version of a grindhouse 70s horror. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> that's really exciting. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> Good God. Okay, I need to see these. these yeah. are... And then yeah. if you, you see something like Natty Knox, which is... Um, directed by the same guy who directed Halloween for the return of Michael Myers. And it has Daniel Harris. Yeah. Has Robert England and it has um, Bill Mosley. And it okay. feels like, and when my review of it, I said, you know, this is not an innovative movie, save for a couple parts that I thought were kind of novel, but it's like, it was watching a really good early two thousands style horror movie and i know halloween four and those movies that that halloween trilogy was like you know late 80s 90s but still i, I know what you mean <laughs> coming from that's yeah. amazing i love i love this i've actually like not not to bring everything back to me <laughs> that's, that's no, not, I, what I'm, you're... <laughs> not, not what i'm doing here but i um i've been writing i'm, I'm kind of like okay let's get back into let's get back into films let's do this come on let's let's get the ball rolling it's difficult <laughs> i'm old there's a lot of things going on at the moment but i've been doing so i've done like three scripts which i'm kind of like playing around with which ones to make the the most recent one which i wrote is a short is a it's it's a short about linnea quigley on the uh, convention circuit um having a kind of benny loves killing experience in right. this place of like paranoia and awfulness and I put Bill Mosley in there as well because why not because why not because like money is cheap when you're writing stuff you can do whatever you want. and it's it's just so funny to hear you talk about like horror conventions and Bill Mosley and the stuff because like without talking to you I've been tapping into the same thing obviously in yeah. the in the and like it's it's there I can you can kind of feel it around in the air and then like trying to do something with it because it, it does feel like there's this um I don't know who to kind of whose door everyone has to go and knock on but someone has to go like it can't just be Jason Bloom all the time he's not like <laughs> he's not the only person there must be other people but there's there's a huge kind of upswing in 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 horror in interest in it and like it's never been easier to make stuff for a small amount of money and to get it seen by a huge amount of people very, very quickly. And I feel like everyone should be doing this. Everyone should be in on this. I don't, I don't know whose door we have to knock on, but someone's because it kind yeah. of needs to. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Troy Escamel and I were talking about that. Um, and that was in our, the chamber most recent episode. Um, and he had said, yeah, between technology and social media, there's just a, a better opportunity now for, um, filmmakers independent filmmakers to be seen and heard yes yes very much yeah maybe there isn't a door that we have to knock on maybe we just you know do it you know but it's there's always a door there's always <laughs> there's always someone in charge of everything um but yeah maybe there isn't there's the door there's someone's in charge of all this but <laughs> yeah i would love to see all this thank you what he wish thank you for being our guest on the chamber absolute pleasure really 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 lovely to meet you and talk to you and um yeah you thank well. you so much for asking me out <laughs>